Welcome back, everybody. Uh, and uh, if you joined us for the first time, a very warm welcome to you. I'm Seku. I am uh, I, I'm an infectious diseases physician, and together with Katia, uh, I am uh, co-chairing this Liverpool workshop. Uh, and in and it's a great pleasure to introduce my co-chair Fiona. Fiona is a consultant pharmacist uh, in Glasgow and both Katia and Fiona are responsible uh, for the huge amount of expertise uh, and work that you have in the HIV uh, and hepatitis website. So uh, 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 we're very grateful to have that input. So the first half of our talk was about the principles of antiviral therapy. And we had a very uh, a, a series of really excellent talks. Uh, and this bit, uh, next bit, is about the practice. So life is never uh, easy or simple or straightforward. Uh, and so we're going to discuss some complex cases and use those principles in order to work out what the best uh, decisions we can make for our for our patients. You've been a fantastic audience. Uh, please keep your questions coming. So don't wait for the end of the talk. Uh, you've got your Q&A button, just post them and we will uh, deal with them uh, in, in, as comprehensively as we can. So please keep your questions coming. A reminder that uh, there is, uh, after each session, we have a survey and we have a post-conference evaluation. Please fill those in. They're essential to us to know how we can uh, meet education needs better. They are really important in terms of trying to get this uh, conference going for future years. If you found it useful, it would be very use uh, very good uh, uh, to hear why, uh, and that there are CME points uh, that you will be emailed uh, at the end uh, when you've submitted your conference. So, we'll go into our uh, we'll go into our series of uh, talks today, which are, uh, we're, I'm really looking forward to. Our first speaker is my colleague Katrina. Katrina is professor of uh, pharmacology in Liverpool, uh, currently uh, uh, living and working out in Uganda uh, and putting uh, her, her skills into practice. Katrina is going to talk to us about complex cases in pregnancy. Katrina. Thank you very much for the invitation to present this challenging case of HIV in pregnancy. Some cases are challenging because they're particularly unique and complex, but this case is challenging in some different ways. It's something that we do see from time to time, and the challenge is often what should we do and what could we do better, if anything. So by way of background, this was a 19-year-old Ugandan woman who was separated from her partner, and she was approximately 33 weeks into her first pregnancy when she attended for her first antenatal appointment. Appointment. And at that appointment, she was given a new diagnosis of HIV. Full history and clinical examination didn't show much else going on. Of course, she was very anxious and upset about the HIV diagnosis. And understandably, given that she'd only come out of home that morning to come to clinic, she had not yet told anybody about her HIV diagnosis. This was at a time when we were enrolling into the DOLPHIN-2 trial, which I'll talk about in a moment, where we were specifically wanting to recruit women with untreated HIV in the third trimester of pregnancy. So as well as counselling about her HIV status, about the need for lifelong antiretroviral therapy, she was told about the trial and she consented to participate. So the first question to think about is whether or not pregnant and breastfeeding women should be included in research. Because you could say this is a huge amount for this young woman to go through. 19 years old, first antenatal appointment, new diagnosis of HIV, commencing on lifelong therapy, and now we want her in a trial. Is that right? Well, I would argue it is right because everybody should have access to evidence-based information to inform their best care. And at this time, the question we had was whether dolutegravir containing regimens might be able to suppress the viral load more quickly than the efavirenz based standard of care. And if you're in the third trimester of pregnancy, there was a genuine concern that the, the standard of care might not reduce the viral load quick enough to protect the infant of transmission. So when you think of the bioethical aspects, there are principles of justice. 
So are there systematic disparities in the medical evidence base for pregnant and breastfeeding women compared to other groups? And what factors affect that disparity? About autonomy, if everybody deserves evidence-based information to make an informed choice, are we curtailing a woman's autonomy because we haven't done that research? Non-maleficence or to do no harm is often the argument we use for not including women in research. However, are we actually inadvertently placing somebody in harm's way because we don't have the evidence for the best treatments? Are we risking using an older, less efficacious, potentially more toxic regimen? And that's almost the direct opposite of beneficent to act with the intent and effect of providing benefits. So we do need to do these studies. It's essential, but we need to do them ethically and we need to do them well. The DOLPHIN trial which has recently been published, recruited between January and August 2018, and we enrolled 268 women between Kampala and Cape Town. We recruited quite quickly, which just shows how many women were still presenting with untreated HIV in late pregnancy. And we enrolled adult women with a new diagnosis of HIV, untreated HIV. HIV in late pregnancy, one-to-one -one randomization to the efavirenz-based standard of care or the experimental dolutegravir arm, which as you know is now used first line in most parts of the world. We followed safety and efficacy up to 72 weeks. And the primary analysis was published a couple of years ago in the Lancet HIV, which showed that in terms of the viral load, dolutegravir acted almost twice as quickly as the efavirenz based standard of care. And the safety was pretty equivalent between the groups. There were no major significant differences in either the safety or rates of mother to child transmission between the arms. But back to our study participant, she was actually randomized to the standard of care arm. And you can see on the slide her viral load trajectory from the day of enrollment through to over a year later. On day 43 of treatment, she gave birth to a healthy male infant, two and a half kilos, and he was HIV tiv at birth. Then, in accordance with protocol and national policy, she breastfed for six months and the infant received prophylactic nevirapine, and the infant had several further negative PCRs. Then, again, according to national policy, she breastfed up to 12 months and then stopped. And each of the blue dots right down on the bottom axis represents her study visit and her undetectable viral load. She didn't bring the infant to all of the visits because of logistics. So this up till now looks like a great success story, doesn't it? She's done treatment, she adhered to it, she suppressed her viral load, the infant's HIV negative, she's breastfed, she stopped breastfeeding. Isn't this fantastic? However, now National policy also requires the infant to have HIV testing after the end of breastfeeding, and that came back from the government lab as positive. This was somewhat shocking to the team, and so we immediately did a repeat in our research lab, and unfortunately it did confirm the diagnosis, and the infant was commenced on national policy regimen. I mentioned we also followed the mother-infant pair up to 72 weeks, and at study exit, unfortunately, her own viral load had now risen probably partly due to ups upset about this whole situation and the distress and the motivation for strong adherence had perhaps gone. But this did present us with the opportunity to do mother and child resistance patterns. Now this doesn't project particularly well, but in summary, we've had fully sensitive strains and you can see from the polymorphisms noted that this seems to be the same virus, confirming that it almost certainly was a direct mother to child transmission rather than an alternative source. So the next question I wanted to think about was what might have gone wrong here? I'm aware this is a pre-recorded presentation, but the discussion is going to be live. So please do use the chat box for anything that you're thinking about, either for this question or any of the others. So what happened? Was it that there was quite a long time between some of the study visits? Was she having blips in between that time? Is that what it meant? Was it a breakthrough transmission because of cell-associated DNA in the breast milk? Was it transmission from another source? I've suggested the evidence goes a bit against that, but it's something we should have at the back of our mind. Or was there something else going on? And into the third discussion point, was breastfeeding the right choice anyway? 
this can be quite an intense discussion, particularly in higher income countries. Of course, in low and middle income countries, formula feeding is not affordable, feasible, acceptable, sustainable or safe to the majority. And therefore, most national policies and the World Health Organization suggest that exclusive breastfeeding is the right thing to do. But actually, breastfeeding has many, many benefits. Benefits. And actually, to understand about things like immunology and the microbiome, the more we see that even if an infant has been HIV exposed but uninfected, they have certain immunological changes that can be offset by the immune factors in mother's milk. So if an infant's been exposed to HIV, perhaps breastfeeding has even more benefits than you might think. I've already mentioned W WHO recommends exclusive breastfeeding because it is still the safest option. And even if a woman could access formula, in many situations, breastfeeding is the only social, culturally acceptable choice. It's quite heartbreaking qualitative work where women talk about how when they're bottle feeding, everyone hounds them about why you're not breastfeeding. And actually it's tantamount to disclosure of HIV status. And that itself is associated with harm. People often worry about drug transfer from mother to breastfed infant, and I could talk about this at length, but the summary is that yes, most antiretrovirals do transfer into the breast milk and can be measured in the plasma of the breastfed infant, but I'm not aware of any cases where that's been associated with drug-related toxicity. But it's not all good, is it? Because there are concerns. From existing evidence, it seems that the risk of HIV transmission is not zero, even if this plasma viral load is suppressed. So the U equals U, undetectable equals untransmissible message is very powerful and very liberating when it comes to sexual transmissions. However, we cannot proclaim that same message for breastfeeding. The reason is thought to be that antiretrovirals suppress the cell-free RNA. So what we measure when we measure viral load, but they don't suppress the cell-associated DNA. And breast milk is a very cellular matrix, and some of the transmissions have been associated with cell-free DNA. Adherence can also be very challenging postpartum, even in the best motivated, most well-organized women. One systematic review of more than 63,000 mothers from a range of settings found that perfect adherence dropped down to about 85%. Another concern is that Whilst the drugs are not toxic, it has been shown in a couple of studies that if an infant acquires HIV through breast milk whilst the mother's on drug, those low concentrations of drug in the infant plasma can help select for resistant strains. And so the infant has a high risk of multi-class resistance, making their own treatment very complex. We didn't see that in this case, but it is a real risk. And when you're having discussions with a mother about individualized choice, there's always questions about how how much risk is acceptable and who should make the choice. The numbers on the slide refer to a range of references if you want to look at this in more detail. And I've put this slide in primarily for the enduring materials. The final discussion point is to do with the fact that this was a woman who presented in very late pregnancy. And whatever it is that makes a woman present late, that situation also means that she's more likely to have adherence challenges. And one of the beauties of the Dolphin 2 program was that as well as the clinical trial, we also had qualitative and health economic research nested within it. And this particular finding has recently been published. So what they found was that women who are diagnosed with HIV in late pregnancy have genuine vulnerabilities. I often argue that the term vulnerable should not be used to describe a woman simply because she's pregnant, because that is a normal physiological state. However, here, what I mean is risks of poor mental health, um, negative attitudes, um, almost accusations of negligence from healthcare providers, then risks to do with disclosure, gender-based violence, abandonment. This is major and healthcare providers have to be very aware of it. Now, of course, this isn't regimen specific and there may be a chance that actually dolutegravir is associated with less depression than if Averins was, we need a bit more data on that. But we must be aware that these women need intensified adherence counselling and perhaps a little bit more follow-up. And we need to work on the best models of care. This quote from one of the South African qualitative participants is, is actually quite heartbreaking because this is a situation that we often 
consistency, that she didn't believe it at first, then she lost interest, she didn't eat, she didn't drink, she didn't take her medication, and eventually there was a transmission. And that's the kind of situation we really want to avoid. So in summary, I hope that I've persuaded you that it is both ethical and essential to do research in pregnancy to inform the very, very best delivery of care. Secondly, at the current time, in low and middle income countries, breastfeeding is by far the best treat, um, infant feeding option. On current evidence, U does not U in breastfeeding. People often ask me to put a figure on it and what exactly is the rate? And that's quite hard to tease out because these are thankfully very rare events these days, but they're frequent enough. If you scour most clinical trials on prevention of mother to child transmission, you'll find one or two cases that are a bit like this, where the women appeared to be virologically suppressed and then a transmission occurred. We need to work together collaboratively to understand this more. I think data such as the PROMISE trial show that it is it's going to be less than one percent but it's not zero and of course there is this risk of psychosocial challenges and the need for intensified support in women diagnosed with HIV in late pregnancy. So it remains to thank all of the study participants and their families, the study team and the funders and I look very much forward to some discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Katrina, for that fabulous talk. And please, um, as Say said at the start, add your questions at the side. Lots and lots and lots we can talk about within that case. Um, I'm delighted to move on to our next talk um, and, and welcome our next speaker, who you'll have met if you were in the first session. So we're delighted to have Dr. Alice Seng with us from um, the University of Toronto in Canada. And I'm sure Alice needs no introduction but she's a pharmacist who is also a professor at the, fa the Faculty of Pharmacy in the University of Toronto, and she is largely responsible for maintaining and continuing the, the fabulous HIV clinic app and website for HIV, for hepatitis C, and now for COVID, which we certainly use um, in Scotland. So thank you very much for joining us. Um, and Alice is going to talk to us today about the rollout of COVID-19 treatments in Canada and experience of treating severe disease. So thank you. Hello, it's a pleasure to be here today and to have the chance to share some of our experiences in managing COVID-19 in Canada in this session. Over the next couple of minutes, I'll give an overview of the rollout of COVID-19 therapeutics across Canada highlight some helpful resources, and walk through a couple of interesting cases highlighting some uh, challenges. Now, it seems like a long time ago, but if you recall, at the beginning of the pandemic, one of the repurposed drugs being studied for treatment of COVID-19 was the HIV protease inhibitor, lopinavir ritonavir. We found that during the first wave, 141 patients hospitalized for severe COVID who were screened for uh, treatment with lopinavir ritonavir in the CATCO study, that over 90% of patients had at least one potential drug-drug interaction with lopinavir ritonavir, with a median of four red or amber DDIs per patient. You can see that this was a somewhat older and sicker population with multiple comorbidities and co-medications and over one third were considered ineligible for the study upfront due to potential drug-drug interactions. In our centers, it was often HIV pharmacists who are redeployed to support screening and DDI management of these patients, given our familiarity and experience in managing interactions with boosted protease inhibitors. Two years later, Nermatrelvir ritonavir or Paxlovid was approved in Canada, and once again, we needed to manage interactions involving ritonavir. However, as we know, there are some significant differences this time around. First, with a focus on treating patients on an outpatient basis to prevent progression to severe disease. The oral formulation and short treatment course also made it a more attractive option to use in smaller centers and rural areas. These differences had both positive and negative impacts on delivery of treatment and management uh, of patients. Now in Canada, there are federal standards for healthcare as per the Canada Health Act, 
but it's the provinces and territories which administer and deliver most healthcare services. As such, each province has had its own system for rolling out treatments such as Paxlovid, with differences in how or where patients can access treatment, depending on prescribing authority or scope of practice, infrastructure, and resources. In some provinces, nurses or pharmacists may prescribe Paxlovid as a delegated health act, although uh, Ontario, where I work, is not one of them. In Ontario, clinical assessment centers can test, assess, and provide treatment options for COVID-19, including Paxlovid, IV remdesivir, and monoclonal antibodies. Once a patient presents at a clinical assessment center, blood work is done, a physician approves the prescription, and a pharmacist does the medication reconciliation, DDI assessment, and dispenses the medication. Follow-up is then done virtually by a nurse or pharmacist. Paxlovid can also be prescribed by any physician or nurse practitioner and, and is dispensed by participating pharmacies across the province. Given the large geography, many remote or small rural sites are serviced by telehealth or virtual pharmacies. These different models can lead to potential gaps in access and care. For instance, most physician offices have limited hours and are closed on weekends and evenings. In many provinces, health and pharmacy records are not centralized, so it can take additional time to obtain important medical information or complete prescription histories. And depending upon patient complexity, identifying and managing important drug interactions can be very time consuming, particularly if there's a need to consult other prescribers. In our institution's assessment center, of the first 211 patients assessed, the majority of patients did receive Paxlovid. And in general, these patients were younger with an average age of 64 and 7.8 co-medications compared to the patients we saw in wave one. Less than 30% had complete medication records accompanying their initial referral. And close to 60% of interactions uh, involved drugs which are not identified on the initial referral form. At another uh, Toronto assessment center, of the first 256 Paxlovid prescriptions, one quarter required a renal dose adjustment. 71% of patients had at least one DDI identified, and most were managed by holding uh, the medication, while one quarter required dose adjustment. On average, it took pharmacists at either center approximately one hour per patient uh, to do all the work necessary to review the referral, complete the uh, best possible medication history, uh, do the drug interaction assessment, contact prescribers, counsel the patient, and complete documentation. So the challenges in rolling out Paxlovid can be even more significant in rural or community pharmacy settings where healthcare providers can be more isolated or understaffed, uh, where they may need to juggle multiple responsibilities, for instance, in a busy retail pharmacy setting, or who may have less experience managing complex DDIs. And sometimes there can be a delay of one to two, day to, one to two days uh, before a prescription is approved or delivered because of the time involved in gathering information and contacting prescribers. Paxlovid is provided free of charge to patients. And pharmacies are re reimbursed a dispensing fee of $13. For these reasons, not all pharmacies choose to have Paxlovid available, and in some cases, Paxlovid may not be prescribed due to DDI concerns by the primary uh, prescriber. In Ontario, the science table created a number of resources for prescribers and pharmacists to support Paxlovid prescribing, and we also encouraged people to refer to the NIH guidelines and the University of Liverpool COVID Interaction website. During this time, a group of pharmacists from the NIH, University of Liverpool, and Ontario started to meet regularly uh, to discuss challenging DDI scenarios. And this was great for sharing knowledge and also ensuring consistency of information between these different resources. Numerous education sessions were also held for family physicians and pharmacists to familiarize them with how to safely prescribe and dispense Paxlovid. One key strategy was to do as much preemptive work as possible, such as identifying higher risk patients, getting relevant lab work done, completing um, a complete medication list, and working out uh, a 
interaction management plan in advance. Patients were counseled on what symptoms to watch out for and the importance of following through within the necessary time frame. Some physicians would give uh, prescriptions to keep on hold at the patient's pharmacy. Uh, things that were much appreciated by pharmacists included uh, writing down a patient's creatinine clearance on the prescription in case dose adjustment was required, and also to have the physicians write their cell phone number rather than an office number on the prescription in order to facilitate quick communication. Here's a, a case of a 62-year-old male uh, living with HIV since 1996 with hypertension, diabetes, or hypertension, dyslipidemia, and type 2 diabetes. He has a history of intermittent uh, antiretroviral therapy and was most recently on Elvitegravir, Cobicistat, Amtricitabine, and TAF uh, with viral suppression, but discontinued this over the pandemic and was lost to follow-up. He recently presented to hospital with seizures and a brain lesion, a low CD4 count, a high viral, and was diagnosed with CNS toxoplasmosis. He was started on dexamethasone for four milligrams every six hours, uh, trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole, and an anticonvulsant. The patient was stabilized and discharged, and the plan was to have him seen in clinic to restart his antiretroviral therapy. However, his serum creatinine jumped, and the physician wondered if the acute kidney injury was due to trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole. Upon further discussion with the patient, uh, he reported experiencing a sore throat for a few days with very limited oral intake. Uh, and he then tested positive for COVID and was uh, considered a candidate for Paxlovid treatment. So to summarize, uh, the clinical issues and priorities for this patient include the following. Uh, treating the CNS toxoplasmosis and continuing to use adjunctive corticosteroids for a few more weeks. Uh, for HIV, he needs antiretroviral therapy due to his low CD4 count and high viral load. And his advanced immunosuppression also does qualify him for COVID antiviral therapy. Finally, with his diabetes, the dexamethasone was making glucose control more of a challenge. So his meta metformin and citagliptin dose was increased to 1,000 milligrams and 50 milligrams twice daily. So when, when considering potential drug interactions, keep in mind that dexamethasone is a CYP3A4 substrate and inducer. Metformin is an OCT2 substrate. And many antiretrovirals, as well as Paxlovid, are substrates and inhibitors or inducers of CYP3A4, uh, p glycoprotein, and other transporters. With dexamethasone, the extent of induction depends on both the dose and duration of treatment. This framework by Jacobs et al. suggests that dexamethasone, when used for COVID-19 treatment, uh, can be considered a weak inducer due to the low dose and short duration of therapy. But when used as adjunctive therapy for toxoplasmosis, dexamethasone is considered a moderate inducer due to a higher dose and longer course of treatment. Therefore, for this patient, we need to consider, first, Paxlovid might increase dexamethasone concentrations, which may be significant as he's already experiencing side effects for, of dexamethasone uh, on uh, glucose control. And since the higher dose of dexamethasone is being uh, used for a more extended duration, there may be potential induction of metabolism of various antiretrovirals. And here, dolutegravir may be a preferred choice compared to other integrase inhibitors or non-nucleoside uh, reverse transcriptase in inhibitors. A quick reminder that antiretrovirals can be continued with dose adjustment while on Paxlovid therapy due to the short duration of treatment and excellent tolerability of modern ARVs. And we should also keep in mind that metformin concentrations can be increased by some integrase inhibitors, with dolutegravir having a more significant effect compared to bictegravir. The dolutegravir product monograph recommends limiting metformin to 1,000 milligrams a day when starting therapy. To wrap up the case then, the patient was prescribed Paxlovid for five days for his COVID, and his dexamethasone dose was reduced by 50% during this time. Antiretroviral therapy was initiated with dolutegravir plus tenofovir DF and emtricitabine in order to avoid concerns about the negative induction effects from dexamethasone. 
and his metformin dose was reduced. The patient recovered from COVID, his dexamethasone was tapered off after one month, and his antiretroviral therapy was subsequently switched to a bitegavir single tablet regimen for improved uh, adherence, and his glucose remains well controlled on the lower dose of metformin. And to uh, wrap up, the second case involves a 65-year-old male, uh, virally suppressed since the mid-2000s. Comorbidities include hyperlipidemia, uh, benign prostatic hypertrophy, osteoporosis, and acute lymphocytic leukemia. He is on a non-boosted antiretroviral regimen consisting of a bitegavir single tablet regimen, plus deraverin and maravara, uh, along with a number of other co-medications. In March, he reached out to me to ask about what potential interactions he should be concerned about just in case he developed COVID down the road and needed treatment. Uh, we recommended that if this were the case, his antiretroviral should be continued. Uh, his uh, rosuvastatin and tamsulosin could be held, or the tamsulosin could be given every other day if he experienced rebound BPH symptoms. For desatinib, uh, we suggested either holding this medication for a week or decreasing the dose while on Paxlovid. Uh, the patient booked an appointment with, with his oncologist to discuss these two strategies, and the oncologist recommended that uh, the desatinib be held. A few months later, the patient uh, did in fact develop COVID and was prescribed Paxlovid. Because all of the drug interactions had been discussed ahead of time, uh, he was able to start treatment with no delays and the treatment was effective at keeping his symptoms extremely mild. So in summary, there are numerous systems for rolling out uh, Paxlovid with differences between provinces and between uh, various settings. Uh, common barriers include a lack of centralized health and medication information, drug interaction complexity, involvement of multiple prescribers, and healthcare provider workload models, which may not support the intensive time required. Uh, to prescribe treatment. Resources to support Paxlovid prescribing and DDI management have been very well received across the province. And patient education and advanced planning have also been very helpful in helping to ensure timely access to medication. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, Alice. And there are many questions coming in from the first two talks, so please keep them coming, uh, and, and we hope that we can uh, cover them in the discussion that follows. So our next talk uh, is by uh, Rob Tahina. Rob Tahina is a uh, associate professor at Radbird University uh, Medical Center in Nijmegen. Uh, he's also the head of the Radbird Applied Pharmacometrics Group uh, and very experienced uh, as a pharmacist, both in clinical trials uh, and with oncology. And Rob is going to talk to us uh, about cancer DDIs. And Rob is unfortunately unable to be with us today. Uh, so he's pre-recorded his talk and uh, the uh, questions and answers will be uh, supported by, by his colleague, David Berger. David is of course, uh, someone who needs very little introduction. David is a, a, a giant amongst uh, pharmacologists involved in uh, 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 involved in HIV uh, and hepatitis clinical trials, uh, 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 drug interactions, uh, and uh, David has been a professor of clinical pharmacology at Radbird also, uh, and uh, author of multiple publications uh, and research uh, uh, lead in drug interaction studies. So, uh, uh, Rob Tahina. Hello everyone, my name is Rob Ter Heine. I'm a hospital pharmacist, clinical pharmacologist, and I'd like to uh, give a lecture about drug, drug interactions between anti-cancer drugs and antiretroviral drugs. Um, unfortunately, I cannot be here today with you um, because I'm enjoying a holiday, but my colleague uh, David Berger uh, is present to answer any questions at the end of this lecture. So, uh, I'd like to touch the following subjects. Uh, there are many similarities between cancer and HIV treatment, actually. I'd like to discuss the different kinds of cancer treatments, but also uh, support, uh, supportive care drugs, uh, and all these uh, drugs may be rele relevant for drug-drug interactions, so therefore I'll shortly discuss them. And thereafter, I'll, uh, I'll discuss the potential pharmacodynamic and pharmacokinetic interactions. And 
I'd like to end with a small summary. Uh, the many similarities of HIV and, uh, uh, and cancer drugs. Um, actually, the first uh, drug used for HIV treatment, cytovidine, is a nucleoside analog and was initially developed as an anti-cancer drug. And it's, it is still sometimes used for uh, cancer drug experiments, but ultimately it was repurposed as antiretroviral drug. And Jerome Horowitz is the, is the inventor of this drug. And he, uh, he, he developed several nucleoside drugs and he thought of them uh, as a very interesting set of compounds that were waiting for the right disease. Well, in 1985, uh, it was found that it could inhibit um, uh, inhibit uh, HIV uh, replication, and that's when the that's when the first uh, treatments were started in people as well. Um, drugs like cytovidine uh, are nucleoside analogs, and they are uh, they uh, they, they resemble DNA building blocks, and they remain the uh, the backbone of antiretroviral treatment. Um, but these kinds of drugs are also used for cancer treatments. So, for example, gemcitabine or decitabine uh, are used in solid cancer and uh, hematological malignancies. And uh, as you may notice, uh, these drugs uh, really resemble each other. And uh, as they in can interfere with the DNA synthesis or RNA synthesis, it is not surprising that um, they may also perhaps inhibit um, HIV replication. And um, this was actually found already uh, some years ago that if you uh, if you have a, in a mouse model for HIV one infection, uh, actually gemcitabine and dicetabine also inhibited HIV replication. So there are many. Uh, so on on this level, there are some similarities in the in the drugs and treatments. Um, notably, uh, immune checkpoint inhibition is a novel cancer treatment modality. Uh, it, uh, it is immune therapy, and it is uh, immune therapy activates T cells, and this appears uh, uh, this appears to be promising to reverse HIV latency, not only. Uh, in vitro or ex vivo, but also in people who are treated, uh, people who have HIV infection and who are treated with uh, immune tech checkpoint inhibitors uh, for cancer. Um, so I'm very curious what the future will be of these drugs, but uh, uh, these drugs were uh, uh, developed for cancer, immune checkpoint inhibitors like pembrolizumab, but they're now also tested in uh, HIV treatment for the purpose of eradication. Um, there is no eradication yet, but uh, uh, yep, they're they're being tested. The other way around, antiretroviral drugs may also uh, exert anti-cancer uh, effects, and the most studied drug is uh, the protease inhibitor nilfinavir, which is an obsolete protease inhibitor. Of course, no one uses it anymore, but uh, there are many many uh, preclinical and clinical studies that show some efficacy of nilfinavir in some tumors and hematological malignancies. And there are various, um, there are various uh, pathways that it is able to, to, uh, to inhibit uh, cellular pathways. Um, well, since the introduction of highly active antiretroviral viral therapy uh, in 1996, triple therapy, the life expectancy of HIV uh, in people living living with HIV have really has really become uh, uh, almost almost normal. And although this is not yet the case uh, for for cancer treatment, um, uh, it is uh, slowly uh, slowly going in that direction as well. So, for example, in uh, in hematological mal malignancies like uh, leukemia. Um, people have been. Uh, people are now uh, being treated as with a chronic disease, and as in uh, HIV treatment, um, the uh, there are uh, complications of uh, of a chronic illness. For example, like cardiovascular disease, uh, and like in HIV, longer survival is equals more comorbidities and uh, equals more drug drug interactions that are possible in 
uh, cancer patients as well. So when you talk about uh, cancer drugs, there are several types of drugs. Um, and I would first like to discuss the classic cytotoxic agents. These are still the mainstay of treatment. And uh, there are several classes, uh, and but they have one thing in common, and that is that they are cytotoxic. Their cytotoxicity is not selective, and they kill rapidly dividing cells, and also rapidly dividing healthy cells. And therefore, the side effects that occur also reflect efficacy. So there may be uh, uh, myelotoxicity, for example, leukopenia, mucositis, or hair loss. And it's often thought that there is a small therapeutic window, um, and these drugs are often dosed at the maximum tolerable dose. Um, you should note that um, that actually the, the toxicity correlates with efficacy. So if you take a look at people who are treated with, uh, uh, with cytotoxic drugs, and it's, this is almost, uh, this can be found in almost any cancer type, uh, if there's neutropenia, people who experience neutropenia have a better survival, which means that, which, uh, and therefore you can imagine neutropenia as a biomarker for efficacy. And actually you want to, yeah, you really want to dose these drugs uh, on the brink of maximum tolerable dose to have a little bit of uh, toxicity. So you are sure that you're also killing cancer cells. This is important to remember and I will come back to it later. Then there's also targeted therapy. Um, this has been, uh, so uh, although untargeted therapy like cytotoxic drugs that were killing all rapidly dividing cells, uh, uh, small molecules and monoclonal antibodies are now developed that target a very specific pathway that is uh, uh, that causes the cancer. Uh, however, many of these drugs are still overdosed due to the old fashioned dose development as uh, where the uh, uh, during dose development, they are escalated to the maximum tolerable dose. And therefore, the toxicity does not necessarily reflect efficacy of these drugs in contrast to cytotoxic agents. And um, there are so many targeted drugs nowadays. There are many uh, pharmacokinetic interactions possible. But the oral targeted drugs, both as perpetrator and victim, uh, however, not with the monoclonal antibodies. Then there's uh, immune checkpoint inhibition. So uh, this is um, uh, this is treatment with monoclonal antibodies, and these monoclonal antibodies they um, they either bind to um, uh, so tumor cells they they ev they ev evade the immune system by uh, putting on the brake on T cells, and the brake is for example PD uh, ligand one. And if you uh, and if you inhibit uh, the speedy ligand one, then it can no longer put a break on uh, the immune system, and the immune system can attack the tumor cell. Other way around, there are also uh, anti PD one antibodies, and um, uh, and therefore the break cannot be pressed anymore, and um, the, the immune system can still attack the cancer cell. And these immune checkpoint inhibitors they uh, cause immune resurrection in case of uh, immune suppression by the cancer. And they reverse immune evasion by the tum tumor, allowing the immune system to attack cancer. Unfortunately, people living with HIV have been historically excluded from trials with uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors. Uh, but as it stands, there is no there are no real signs for reduced efficacy from real world data. Um, these drugs are, are however, mo uh, monoclonal antibodies. There are some small molecules in development, but they are uh, not on the market yet. And with the currently approved drugs, there are no drug-drug interactions expected. Important to realize is that uh, people who are undergoing cancer treatment with uh, drugs uh, also uh, uh, receive a lot of supportive care uh, and also receive uh, so uh, often receive supportive care drugs. For example, antiemetics. Um, Sometimes if you have neutropenia, you get colony stimulating factors. People who have uh, severe neutropenia or are expected to, uh, to have severe neutropenia, they get prophylactic antibiotics or prophylactic antifungals. And people who are on uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors and uh, who develop um, who develop immune-related side effects uh, sometimes receive uh, immune-modulating agents. 
and also people who have received stem cell transplantation needs uh, immune suppression. And as you may realize, this may all also cause uh, interactions or be subject to interactions as well. So you should really keep that in mind. There are, there's usually relatively limited data on drug-drug interactions between anti-cancer and antiretroviral drugs. Um, with classical cytotoxic drugs, drug-drug uh, interactions in, uh, studies are hardly performed. Dosing of these agents is, uh, is, is balancing the fine line between subtherapy and, and, and very severe toxicity, and a drug interaction will therefore almost of, always negatively impact the risk-to-benefit to, the risk to benefit balance. So these studies are hardly performed while they're so necessary. And also, people living with HRV are, uh, are often excluded from trials, so uh, in not a lot of data are uh, collected. So, can there be pharmacodynamic drug-drug interactions with cytotoxic drugs? Theoretically, there can, there can be. Um, there may be many examples. I, I would like to, to show, you, show you this one. Um, uh, or these, uh, some nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors may cause hematological toxicity, and this is mostly cytopidine, but this drug is hardly used anymore. So, uh, I don't think this is much of an issue. There is some preclinical evidence that enteroviral effect of nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors can be enhanced by cytotoxic drugs because cytotoxic drugs can also inhibit DNA synthesis. Uh, and so these are some in vitro experiments where, uh, where uh, Raltitrexet, uh, a fo folate inhibitor, is added to abacavir, tenofovir, of, uh, or amtricitabine. And uh, what you see is that there is synergy. There is a lower concentration of one of these nucleosides and, and that's required to inhibit uh, viral replication. And of course, this is not strange because if you, uh, if you inhibit uh, DNA synthesis uh, uh, by two mechanisms, there may be uh, additive or synergistic effects. Can there be pharmacokinetic uh, drug drug interactions with classical cytotoxic drugs? Yes. Of course, there can be uh, um, cytotoxic drugs per perpetrators is mostly, uh, is often not relevant because they are usually dosed in cycles. A lot of cytotoxic chemotherapy is dosed uh, weekly or uh, once every three weeks because you need to uh, have, uh, uh, you need to recover your immune system after, after the dosing. So they're not, uh, often not administered chronically. Um, of course, there are exceptions, but this this means that the uh, the drug drug interactions are usually not uh, relevant. Um, of course, there is another exception as well. Uh, people who are under, who are undergoing um, stem cell therapy receive a lot of chemotherapy, and this often causes mucositis. And mucositis may impact the bioavailability of other drugs. So, for example, with the antifungal drug posiconazole, it was found that uh, in case of uh, mucositis in, uh, in stem cell recipients, uh, the bioavailability of posiconazole was reduced by 25%. And of course, this may also happen with antiretroviral drugs. It has, ever, it has never been studied, but the mechanism may be the same. Pharmacokinetic drug-drug interactions with cytotoxic drug as victim can be relevant because you have a, a very small therapeutic window and there may be various of pathways that may cause drug-drug interactions. And I think the most important uh, pathways uh, with antiviral, drug, antiviral drugs are either a CYP3A uh, induction or inhibition or a, a drug transporter uh, induction or inhibition. And this may, of course, be caused by uh, drugs like uh, inhibition, may be caused by drugs like Cobicistat, um, Ritonavir, uh, and induction may, of course, also be caused by non nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors. Um, there may also be pharmacokinetic drug drug interactions with target therapy, or this is actually uh, uh, um, uh, androgen uh, therapy. And uh, androgen inhibitor uh, uh, therapy. For example, the drug enzalutamide is a very strong inducer. It, it, it's on the same level as rapamycin, 
And um, so this has, happened, this has been studied for various cytochrome uh, enzymes, and you see that enzalutamide is up there. Um, and, and it causes a, a very large change in, uh, in expression of, of enzymes, of all these drugs, of, of all these, uh, of all these um, cytochrome enzymes. And this may be relevant for most integrase inhibitors, non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors, and protease inhibitors. And there are, of course, other targeted drugs as well, but uh, I'm not listing them all here, but you should just realize that they can also cause drug-drug interactions. Um, they may also cause uh, UGT inhibition. Um, um, uh, some of the target therapies may cause this, and this may uh, this may apply to integrase inhibitors, but it's not likely to be relevant to, due to the large uh, therapeutic window of these uh, integrase inhibitors. Uh, target therapy can also be a victim of drug-drug interaction. So this is just a small list. There are so many more uh, uh, targeted uh, uh, drugs, but uh, you should just realize that, well, inducers may cause relevant interaction where you need those adjustments, and the same goes for in inhibitors. So uh, efavirenz, nif nifarapine, and treferine may all, all cause induction, and ritonavir and cobistat may all cause uh, inhibition of metabolism, and this may be very relevant and you for the target therapy and those adjustments uh, uh, may be required. Don't, uh, don't forget to support care, care drugs. Um, uh, this is just a, a list of, of, uh, of interactions that may occur from with a small selection of supportive care drugs with, uh, for example, the Runevir, Cobicistat, or Efavirenz, and see that there's a um, you see that there is an uh, that there is an interaction uh, potential with almost every drug. So, um, if you have a patient who is on, who is going to receive or is receiving cancer treatment, please realize that there are also other drugs uh, administered additionally as well. In summary, if there are drug interactions with cytotoxic drug, when in doubt err on the side of toxicity because toxicity equals efficacy and, and oncologists are very used to toxicity they even expect it it is very well monitored and uh, it is uh, especially in the curative setting and there may be some other uh, uh, reasons not to do it uh, if you're in a palliative setting or uh, but it, especially in the curative setting please realize that toxicity uh, equals efficacy and uh, a next cycle a dose reduction can be performed and the toxicity is extensively monitored with the cytotoxic drug uh, uh, as a potential perpetrator uh, of pharmacokinetic drug drug interactions please realize that most cytotoxic drugs are admi administered cyclically so uh, the drug drug interaction is not always present drug interactions with targeted drugs Many relevant drug-drug interactions are possible, both as a uh, perpetrator and victim. Uh, and most relevant interactions occur with targeted drugs as victims due to inhibition or induction of metabolism by ret retinovir, cobicistat, and uh, non nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors that induce metabolism. And furthermore, when in doubt, um, uh, consult your uh, a clinical pharmacologist. Thanks for that fabulous talk, Rob and um, David. Um, there's lots of questions came in, so I'm looking forward to hearing some discussion on that topic um, following the next talk. And thank you for staying with us. I'm absolutely delighted to um, introduce this final talk. So Professor Andrea Calcagno um, is speaking today on long-acting therapy when things go wrong. Professor Calcagno um, is uh, Associate Professor at the University of Torino. However, he's obtained a national qualification for full professor in infectious disease. He's also a consultant in infectious disease um, at the hospital in Torino and is a, a panel member for the Italian guidelines on the use of antiretrovirals and is Associate Editor for BMC Infectious Disease, Infectious Disease and Tropical Medicine and PLOS One journals. So thank you so much for being with us today and um, welcome. We look forward to your talk. Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon and, and good evening. 
It's a pleasure to, to share with you some thoughts about long acting therapies and what might happen when things go wrong. I'm Dr. Kanye from the University of Turin, and I will just go through some doctor's slides and then present you a, a clinical case we, we actually followed this summer. So um, I, what I think import, is important is just to take a look at what happened in terms of virological failures to patients switching to long acting chemotagravine with PIVRI. Uh, I think the data suggests that these events are rare, between 1.3 and 2%. And if you take a look, these are the, the, the longest follow-up. So this is the trial, the ATLAS 2M trial, and this is the, the 152 weeks uh, follow-up. So three years of follow-up. Uh, you see here in the bars that virological non-response was low, between 1 and 2.7%, with some difference between once every month and once every two months injections. And, and globally, so we have 14 confirmed biological failures. And interestingly, uh, two failures were observed between the second and the third year. So very late, actually, failures. And that could be important for us for understanding what happened on the long term of this treatment that we actually don't have that, such a large follow-up for, for a large number of patients. So if you take a look at them, uh, there, were, uh, there are two male with a low BMI to different countries. They were taking a drug every two months, different subtypes, with only patient two having the name famous A601 uh, subtype. And importantly, uh, there were selection resistant associated mutation, both for rupivirin and from carbotegravir. This, I think, is an important point. Uh, and uh, I took this slide from, from the summary of the characteristics that relate to what happened until week 96. If you take a look here, uh, seven patients uh, every, in the every two month administration, uh, select resistant to Lpivir and five to, uh, to Cabotegravir and one and two uh, uh, respectively uh, in, in patients receiving the drug every month. So the selection resistance mutation is rare. You see here numbers are pretty low uh, as compared to a thousand, almost a thousand patients receiving these combinations, but still that may impact our, our uh, choices and our treatment regimens afterwards. Yet, uh, uh, the data we have now in 13 out of 14 patients, uh, they were able to resuppress on oral basic regimens. One that was actually judged not to be that adherent, it was not able to. So the majority of those were reaching viral suppression uh, with oral treatments. The interesting thing is that if we tease out adherence, because of course patients are taking injections, and of course uh, we all include in this kind of analysis on those taking them uh, in time with some uh, uh, a few days window. Uh, if you if you see here, this is the union multivariate analysis uh, that performed on the Atlas and Lattice studies, and you see here in the gray bar, uh, in the light gray, you see the factors. So there is something about PK, there is something about body mass index. There is something about sit times. Uh, there's something about uh, resistant associated mutation to repivirin and all female gender and every two months administration. But then in the multivariate analysis, only three factors were retained as independently associated with biological failure. And they were the HIV subtype by 6A1, a BMI above 30, and repivirin resistant associated mutation. But if you take a look also at how much each of these factors is associated with failure, you see the effect is very small. Probably when you, when you start to have at least two factors, you see it raises to 25%. That is not actually very small. And then we only had one patient with all three factors and that patient failed. So this 100% is just a bit unfair, but I think it's important to know this and to see what happened in, um, in, in real life. So that, that goes to our clinical case. Uh, um, so he's a male, 44 years old. He was diagnosed three years ago uh, for, for a three months history of abdominal pain, low appetite, weight loss, actually lost five kilos, neutropenia, um, and larger liver, and we thought of steatosis so because of the ultrasound and crazy ALTAC that she has uh, after three years. Uh, he actually started with very low. So he's a very low presenter with nine CD4 cell count and a CD4 to CD8 ratio 0 0.1. Uh, HIVRNA was about uh, around 1 million uh, copies per ml. And he also has the replication of CMB um, in blood. You see here 26,000 copies of CMB. And no other confection, no other comorbidities. So it was actually, uh, uh, didn't have clear opportunistic infection at this time. Also taking a look, 
at his baseline resistance test, you see it was a B subtype, and there were not major or minor resistance associated mutations, such polymorphism, but all of them are not judged to be uh, so far uh, clinically relevant in terms of uh, reducing the efficacy of the drug we're going to use in this patient. So what we did, well, actually we did, we used a Vulcan cycle here. Uh, I know it, it could be also be an interesting discussion of what to do in patients that just have CMV viremia without having great inidios or colitis. We, in those with a very low CD4 account, we usually have a short treatment with Vulcan cycle here in order to reduce as much as possible CMV replication. Uh, it's not a prophylaxis uh, with cotrimoxazole, some col colocalciferol for vitamin D deficiency, lansiprazole for G-reflux, semiprazolam for anxiety, and then it was taken care in terms of psychiatric and psychological consultation and get rid of this um, uh, benzodiazepine. And then it was started on taf ftc bictegravir with a short response. So it took some months to get to uh, viral suppression, and so HIVRNA was below 20 copies of one year. Uh, after a very good decrease at the beginning, it stayed between 100 and 300 for a long time. And this is something we observe very often in late presenters. So we don't know that actually worried about it. Uh, also, CD4 is low increase. And finally, at one year, it was about 200 uh, CD4s at count. Um, so three months afterwards, so 40 months after treatment didn't start, uh, it was still a lansoprazole on demand. It was an hour recommendation, but it still took it sometimes. I was taking TAF FTC big tegavir with a viral load below 20 copies and 244 uh, CD4 account. Um, so he was enrolled in one of the trials and uh, without leading, he started long acting capotegamory epivory. What happened here? So this in, in this light blue are CD4 cell count. You see they were pretty stable between two and 300. So with some oxidation, but still between two and 300. Uh, while HIV RNA remained below 20 copies until month seven, where we saw the first raise in HIV RNA to 116 copies, then confirmed to be 53, but then went back to suppression to below 20 copies. So patient was stayed actually in treatment. But month 13, uh, HIV RNA raised it again, 194 copies, and at the control that was actually two weeks afterwards was 5,000 copies and so on. Uh, for this reason, patient was withdrawn from a trial and changed to another treatment. Luckily, we, uh, in this patient, we had three genotypes, and all three genotypes uh, suggested there was no resistant associated mutation, both in re for repivirin uh, or and for uh, carbotegavir. So it was switched back to TAF, FTC, Bictegavir, and one month later, HIV DNA was below 20 copies and CD4 were, were stable to 191. So I think one important point could be pharmacokinetics, um, and we're going to discuss about it afterwards. Uh, you see here the numbers. I also have to admit that we are not very good because at the times where uh, it had a programmer visit of the trial, we didn't collect the samples for PK. That would be the best sample because it was would be a, a real trough, let's say. But still, we can have some information about how, how these numbers a uh, um, work on, 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 on a figure. So this is a slide I asked Kathy Marzellini permission to, to, to show you. This is one from, from our of the um, group recently published papers. It's a real life TDM um, registry of patients receiving long acting capotegamory repivirin. And you see that repivirin concentration plotted at the almost right time point are either on the medium values or both them. On the contrary, if you take a look here at this blue asterisk, uh, these are carbotegavir concentration in our patients. They are uh, actually below what is expected in patients this, let's say, at three stage because we're already around one year. They, and uh, if you take a look at these, for example, uh, sample at 37 days, it's approximately at the 10th percentile. So kind of low, uh, uh, lower than the majority of patients receiving long acting carbotegavir period. So, now it's just my interpretation. So uh, I think we can discuss this, why this happened. Um, well, there, I think it it's, might be multifactorial. So there might be there for several reasons, maybe can all of them together. One is probably this patient was a very late presenter. So he's probably his reservoirs in terms of lymph nodes, the gut, the brain were really full of HIV in terms of HIV RNA and DNA. And, and so, there might be some release of HIV RNA from these reservoirs. And that's why what we observe in late presenters with these viremia that persist in for longer times, 
Uh, some interesting data suggests that most of these viruses are defective virus just being released, and we're not able to tease this out that, uh, unless we use very advanced technique. Um, I think I also have two questions for you or for further discussion. So what about dual therapies and sanctuary sites? So we know that we don't start with dual therapies in advanced patients because the failure rates are higher. Uh, so maybe it was an early switch. So maybe not the perfect choice we made in this patient. Um, but it also raises the, the, the question, what happened in sanctuary sites when patients are switched to two drugs? So we don't have much data so far. We have a couple of papers suggesting in terms of CSF, HIV, RNA, CSF inflammation, CSF neuro and markers of neuronal damage. There's not difference between dual therapies and tribal therapies, but I still think we need, we need to have, get more data and all, on other compartments as well. The second point on this topic, I think is the interaction of, of herpes viruses. So mostly it's CMV and EBV, because we've been knowing their effect in terms of inflammation and boosting HIV uh, for a long time. Um, and this patient had a high viral load of CMV uh, DNA in, on, on the blood, uh, no EBV, but we know that this, these viruses can actually enhance HIV uh, replication. That might be part of the story. We don't have CMV DNA controls over time, so I, I can't tell you if, if CMV was still replicated one year after treatment, and now it's in common. And the last point is about uh, pharmacokinetics and mostly about chemotegory pharmacokinetics. So what do we know about this topic? Well, in the same paper I showed before about union multivariate analysis factor associated with biological failures, uh, the researchers suggested there was an effect uh, in Atlas and FLARE studies in which low carbotegravirin repivirin concentration at week eight were actually associated with failure. And also suggested that at least the majority, majority say 70% of patients that have biological failures had plasma concentration of both drugs below the median value. So they concluded say that we don't have enough data to, to, to let's say, uh, to tease this out, but that could be a contributing factor. And also they observe the association between high BMI and low uh, carbotegravir repivirin exposure. That's why what led to our uh, practice now using longer needles and maybe taking uh, a special attention to obese patients starting those treatments. Um, again, just going back to the, to the real-life TDM registry and switch of HIV cord from Katia Marzolini's group, uh, they also reported that 13% of patients had low repivoting concentration, lower than expected, but also there was a single patient with very low carbotegravir, very low repivoting exposure, uh, and this guy had, well, was injecting anabolic steroids before starting uh, um, carbotegravir longatin, but also had enhanced physical activity raising the question if the enhanced physical activity may result in greater absorption and there a quicker elimination of uh, carbotech repivirin. So I think this is also an interesting question I need to, to assess in the future. I also want to, I found it interesting that NRS suggested to perform TDM, therapeutic drug monitoring patient, receiving long-acting carbotech repivirin. Uh, in certain occasion, uh, certain indication, you see here the third point is biological failure, including low-level viremia. I think is our case in this, in, uh, uh, of this patient. And you see the other thresholds were actually low for repivirin, below 32 nanogram per ml, but, uh, but below 1,120 nanogram per ml for carbotegravir. And in our patient, we had at least two out of three determined measurements, although not try, that were below this, this threshold, so maybe a risk factor. So the very last point is what should we do? So what happens if we see a patient on long getting carbotegravir repivirin and we see a raise in HIV RNA? So we need to confirm this, uh, but maybe waiting for the confirmation and bear in mind all the studies suggesting that the selection resistant associated mutation were, were kind of rare, but important in terms of the impact on future therapies. I think maybe we can think of introducing uh, uh, an oral compounds to, to compensate somehow because we don't want the virus to replicate with a, with a very low tail uh, of drugs uh, uh, in, in their blood because it's a perfect scenario for selecting resistant associated mutations. So I just put here two hypotheses of oral uh, drugs uh, that we, the high genetic barrier that may possibly introduce a while waiting for confirmation of this, of this viral load. And with this, I think I just wanted to, to enhance the discussion of, of this topic of the reason why patients may fail, something about PK, is something about what should we do while we wait for confirmation of HIV or May. And uh, with this, I just would like to acknowledge the, the work of all people working in Torino on, on, on HIV and, and, and TDM. 
and I want to thank you for your attention. Welcome back, everybody, and thank you for, for four fabulous talks. And we have lots of questions um, in, the, in the comments chat. And, and please, um, if you have any final ones, squeeze them in and we'll try our best to, to add them in. I'm going to start with Katrina, just for, from the, the, the order of, of talks. Um, Dr. Suleiman's asked, Katrina, um, are, are you aware, are there any studies demonstrating mother to child transmission events in a, in a case where the mother is undetectable? Um, and do you think that prevention of uh, mother to child transmission um, in, in the context, there'll be an added value of measuring breast milk viral load to, to better anticipate risk um, in the future? So I, I guess in relation to your case and, and the kind of follow up question to that is, um, what are your thoughts on it, the possible explanation um, uh, uh, with, with this particular patient? Thank you. Um, it's, a, <clears throat> it's a great question. And what we saw in our case is not, not really isolated. So when you look at some of the older PMTCT studies, for example, the BAN study that was done in Malawi many years ago, there are one or two cases where the mother had undetectable both plasma and breast milk viral load at the time point closest to when transmission occurred. So there's often quite a long debate about whether if the appointments were, say, six months apart, could she have blipped in between? Mm -hmm. A bit like the later follow-ups in our case. But the breast milk viral load was all also undetectable in cases. And that makes me feel generally that measuring breast milk viral RNA, the, vir the viral load might not be helpful because if we're looking at cell associated transfer of virus, you're not gonna pick that up. You would need a different assay. I saw that there was a question about the role of potentially maternal microchimerism. And that is a very interesting question. To those who are not familiar, this is an absolutely fascinating phenomenon where early in breastfeeding, when the infant gut is still very permeable, so really the first couple of weeks of life, the breast milk cells actually cross through the gut and enter into the infant and really start to have an effect. So that can be a big problem problem in early transmissions and in fact indeed it might contribute to the reservoir of virus we don't really understand it well enough but i don't think that's plausible in our case because we know that the infant was eight negative for a long time so it's almost too late for that phenomenon to have occurred in our case thank you thanks that's that such an interesting topic and I, I suppose with regards to, to breastfeeding, um, I 100% agree and the, the data is, um, is unarguable. Um, for cases like this, the, the, in a in a perhaps a, a a European population, an American population, do, do, does it prompt more discussion about not breastfeeding? Is it something we need to think about or are these all case by case decisions? Um, because we do have um, alternatives available and I think it's something that we discuss at our own um, pregnancy MDT on a regular basis and the conversation has changed significantly in the, over the last five to ten years. I think a lot of this comes down to making sure that we prevent present the evidence as it is. So <clears throat> the available evidence does not say that U equals U in breast milk. So we cannot say to the mother, oh, you're fully suppressed, you're dear into your therapy, the risk is zero. We know it is not exactly zero. And then the question arises about how much risk is acceptable. Because the thing is with considerations of risk, you always think that the alternative has absolutely zero risk. And that's why on the slide, I pointed out the potential harms of, of not breastfeeding. So many of our women living with HIV are from different populations where actually breastfeeding is really the, the social acceptable choice. And if these women are forced to disclose their status to that, that also carries risk of other kinds of harms. So I would tend to have an approach where I lay out the evidence as we have it to the mother and allow her to make that informed choice with support and realize that 
that choice can change over time. You start discussing it in pregnancy, you follow that up, knowing that women can change their minds and that they might make the choice over a series of consultations. So keeping a patient at the centre of care. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Katrina. So um, we have a question from Dr. Cheng Sun um, for Alice. So uh, in our country, uh, AIDS patients, HIV patients are excluded from every shells, uh, presumably in the context of prophylaxis. Uh, how the broader question, how do you manage health inequity in COVID therapeutic rollouts? So uh, I think it's striking that when you look at Epic HR or uh, or, or move out, uh, uh, or, or some of the uh, Gilead studies from Remdesivir. There are, there are, there are anything from um, 20 to 30 countries represented across the board, and yet those countries still today do not get uh, access to those drugs. So, Alice. Yeah, I, <laughs> I would open up to help from any other panel member with this question because I, I think there's so many facets that. Uh, are, are that come into play in, in if you're talking about access I mean one is you know are, are people with living with HIV are they excluded as a population like up front from various things and you know there's you know how do we address that that uh, that problem and and then also just the, the practical um, uh, practical considerations and making sure that even people who qualify can still often uh, um, face extreme challenges and in, in actually accessing uh, drugs and um, uh, you know, certainly in Ontario and Canada, we that that latter point is is something that um, we that comes up often, just because um, you know, just our, our, our vast differences in in uh, geography and and um, population density. So some of the smaller uh, rural set settings, it just it can be so much harder to to get access to. Um, you know, you have people driving to different cities to try and and get access to to treatment sometimes, and how feasible is that if they're you know sick or supposed to be isolating or don't have access to to private transport, etc. So I don't know if I have a great answer. I think maybe trying to um, really support alternate models of care where you, you know, and Fiona can probably speak to this about, you know, pharmacist prescribing or, or making making certain therapies available in non-traditional uh, types of, of sites and, and settings to to allow more more flexibility and, and more more outreach. Um, but... um, um, uh, it, it, have you got any data from Canada? How many people um, con referred for Paxlovid can't actually have it or, or are not given it? Or are, is there a problem with people over denying Paxlovid? I think um, from our own center's experience, the majority of people who were referred did in fact qualify. Um, but in, you know, the question is out of that portion, like how many more people were were positive who could have qualified and didn't come forward? Uh, I think that's something that's still uh, a bit hard for us to get uh, a handle on. I think sometimes, you know, there's still maybe a bit of a, a patient education gap uh, on on people knowing whether they qualify for it or not, or prescribers not being sure of the process. Uh, I can see even like in the early stages, even with very motivated, experienced, you know, physicians it was still a bit of a you know where do we go how do we get this it, it was still um still challenging uh, initially um so yeah i don't know fiona if you have any other comments or experience yeah i mean i mean i think access is is so interesting because i mean we get questions from all over the world and no two countries have the same policy no two you know so hiv patients in some countries have access some they're not sick enough which is good they're not seen as high enough risk and um, other countries in in trials uh, you know that there's perhaps not the understanding of I hiv and that what does that mean for your Im immune system are you immune suppressed most of our patients as we know are, are not if they're well controlled so no two countries and even within the the uk there's the, the different adaptions of, of of how we're treating patients so um it's it's hugely variable um who who has access to these medications at the moment and hopefully things will expand and trials will expand um but yeah absolutely it, it, it's a it's a huge um pool of of, of variation 
just um, I can think of so many more COVID questions, but just in in, in um, with time, um, there's a great question for, from Tessa for you, David. Um, so so, so uh, Tessa has said that she f finds DDIs um, challenging for anti-cancer drugs um, because per particularly for older agents, that as with any drug, we don't have detailed DDI studies completed. And then for the newer agents in oncology and haematology, often um, these drugs are pushed to the market quickly via accelerated approval, which is great, but often means that clinical DDI studies can be lacking. So um, additional, also additionally, cancer-related outcomes are not um, the, the focus of these studies. So I, I, I guess the question is, um, do you have any suggestions on how we can do this better or, or um, how we advocate or design for useful and timely DDI studies in the clinical area of oncology? Yes, thank you, um, Fiona. Thank you, Tessa, for uh, bringing this up. Um, it's a uh, it's a difficult question uh, and and not that easy to to answer because there uh, there are many anti cancer agents uh, being developed, and of course uh, uh, there is a risk for for drug drug interaction as was explained uh, by my colleague uh, Rob de Heine. Um, whether you really need uh, the the DDI studies for for all of the possible agents uh, that that can be combined, I think that that will be imp impossible. Um, definitely, we we should need uh, good guidance in in the product labels from both the anti cancer agents and the HIV drugs. That it it, it is very clear uh, what you can expect um, based on uh, on information that is collected during clinical uh, development. Um, if there is a specific combination that that you expect uh, that is going to be combined uh, very often in a patients with HIV and cancer, of course it will be ideal to to have a a, a clinical drug drug interaction uh, study, uh, but uh, that that won't be that easy. I, I think that in in clinical management we have uh, nowadays the possibility to uh, try to avoid uh, a drug drug interaction. So instead of having data for all kind of DDI. Uh, combinations, I think with uh, with the unboosted integration inhibitors with uh, a drug like Doravirin, uh, maybe also the long acting uh, injectables, um, you have less uh, potential of causing an interaction from the HIV side to the anti-cancer side. Um, and, and, and only in situations where you don't have that possibility uh, because of uh, resistance uh, development in the past and, and you are really stick with, uh, with a boosted PI, for instance, then it becomes more, more difficult and more complicated. And, but there are so many anti-cancer agents uh, that it will be difficult to have really clinical DDI data. What could be helpful uh, if, if, if people uh, share their experience with, with combined treatment, either through case reports, case series. Uh, Pepe Molto has, uh, has a project uh, where people can submit their uh, DDI experience, both positive and negative. So at least we have some more basis and experience. Uh, it will not be high quality evidence, but at least we, we can learn uh, from, from that experience. So I think that, that's a little bit of an answer to this uh, important question, but <laughs> quite difficult to answer. Thanks. Thank you. Um, oh, see, on you go. I, I, so I want to leave, there are lots of questions for Andrea as well, and, and your case was absolutely fascinating. So I, I, I'll start with one of my questions first. The absence of genotypic resistance, particularly rupivirine, is surprising actually, because it's at odds with Atlas, um, Atlas 2M and, and Flare data. Um, and I suspect you got the failure early because, uh, uh, because most people who fail will have some resistance, I think, from the clinical trials. So my question is, how often were you measuring the viral loads of these people? Because in the trials, they did it two monthly. Yeah, thank you much. We were also surprised. We were actually expecting the worst. Um, we were measuring them every month, and that's why we actually captured the first blip even before the the, 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 the planet visit. Uh, and so I think there was kind of alert on this patient. Um, maybe I think it was, I was really surprised for the five thousand copies at the end of the, the even higher than what is expected. So I, it's surprising to me, actually, um, and we were lucky in, from this point of view. 
It's very odd. I think it underlines the fact that you don't sit on this, you, you act very quickly, because if you don't, they'll become resistant. Uh, there's a question around um, uh, commenting on two drug regimens compared to three drug regimens. I think you did cover that in your in your talk. Uh, and another question from from Kate about the fact that in the UK and 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 most of Europe, it's only the eight week uh, injections that are that are funded. Uh, and so what would what would you be doing in patients that you might worry about high risk, fact, uh, risk, risk, risk factors for failure? Uh, so we actually, we don't know. I think the difference in the selection of resistance is just only one patient's letter resistance in those receiving every month suggests that could be an option. But on the other the other side, just coming to the clinic 12 times a year probably can, can, uh, won't be my, my, my first choice in the long run. Uh, so even if a patient's preference in the trials was, was good also for, the, for every four weeks arm, I still think that we probably there might be other options. Um, I just will reserve it to patients that cannot actually take it by 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 oral uh, way. Thank you, thank you. I really could go on forever. This is so interesting, um, and I think this is just the start of how we manage these these complex cases in pregnancy with long acting treatment in cancer with COVID. Uh, so thank you to all our speakers for an excellent afternoon. Thank you to all of you audience who've been very patient. Uh, you've been a fabulous audience and the questions are still coming through. So, so thank you very much to you. Uh, I want to thank my co-chairs, uh, Alice, uh, Fiona and Katia. Um, and to remind you to fill in your uh, session questionnaires and your uh, post-conference uh, evaluation. Uh, and lastly, I do want to thank V. V have been a, a, a fantastic supporter. Uh, of of these workshops uh, going forward, and uh, I'm really grateful to them for the for the for the generosity uh, uh, and, uh, and and support that we have had. So thank you very much, everybody, and I wish you all a good evening. Thank you.